Welcome to the Sidewalk Weekly Podcast, a show for people who are big on cities but short on time. I'm Vanessa Cork. Eric, did you hear about these uh, New Yorkers who are secretly and slyly seeking out haircuts? What are you trying to suggest? <laughs> I mean, you, you do have a bit of a poof developing. I thought we were going to keep this from the listeners. <laughs> they don't know that my hair now goes down to my knees and my beard is only slightly shorter than that. They need to know the truth, Eric. What What is there but the truth? I haven't left this apartment in so long. This is a vacation from myself. This is my, my only hope here. This podcast? <laughs> this podcast. <laughs> I meant this hair, but the podcast too. And with that, I'll welcome our city lovers to the Sidewalk Weekly. I'm Eric Jaffe. We'll spend the next 20 minutes or so discussing the biggest stories from the urban tech world this week, and we'll chat with Sidewalk's own street guru, Willa Eng. When time's up on a segment, you'll hear our little bicycle bell. Bing! This week, our top stories look at the end of our Toronto project, Mm. the future of office design, and a little-known autonomous vehicle company trying to make a big impact on safety. All right, well, let's dive into the sad story of the week for us. Let's dive into that. Our CEO, Dan Doktoroff, who's writing on Medium yesterday, announced that, sadly, uh, unfortunately, Sidewalk Labs is no longer pursuing its Keyside project in Toronto. Vanessa, this is a tough day uh, for all of us here, for us personally, too. Mm -hmm. We've worked on this project for several years now. Why don't you kind of start maybe with what Dan said? Sure. So, I mean, for those who've been following us, you'll know that, you know, for the last two and a half years, we have been completely invested and passionate about making Keyside happen, this neighborhood on the waterfront of Toronto, right? So we've invested time and people and resources into this project. We even opened this really extraordinary office on the waterfront called 307, where a lot of our Toronto-based colleagues work. We have 30 colleagues there, and we've held tons of events and exhibitions. So, you know, this was really our focus for Two and a half years. And we will continue to have an office in Toronto, by the way, with the staff there working on uh, potentially a variety of different projects. So I'll, I'll note that. Yeah, which is really fantastic because that team is really extraordinary up, that we have up there in Toronto. So, yep. but to get back to the <laughs> to the unfortunate story at hand. So Dan wrote this week that, you know, the economic uncertainty that we're experiencing right now is really unprecedented. It's set in around the world and also in the Toronto real estate market. So the economics of the project became really difficult. To make this 12-acre project financially viable would have been too difficult to do without sacrificing really core parts of the plan that we developed with the government agency up there, Waterfront Toronto. And that would have really gone against our goal, which was to build a truly inclusive, sustainable community. And I think that would have kind of defeated the whole point, really, right? Yeah. I mean, I think a little more background for folks. I've been involved in this project from the very beginning, very proud to have helped kind of our original response to Waterfront Toronto's RFP in 2017. So the project launched in October 2017. We had this shared goal with Waterfront Toronto to create, you know, really a new type of urban development, something that doesn't happen these days, especially in core downtown areas by using the latest advances in digital, physical, and, and design innovations. Yeah. So, you know, this was an intentionally ambitious project from the very start, right. and it really made a lot of sense because the way things are happening in cities right now, as we've talked about a lot on this show, you know, the status quo just, it's not cutting it, no. right? You get a whole lot of luxury housing, you get a tiny sliver of affordable housing maybe, you pay some lip service to energy efficiency, And that's just not enough, right? We need really strong levels of housing affordability. We need precedent-setting levels of greenhouse gas reductions. And that was the point of this project, to show that you could do a different type of model. And unfortunately, we just couldn't get there at the 12 acres of Keyside. Right. And and one other way that I think this project was pretty innovative, too, was about the all the public engagement that we did. Um, Dan wrote about how grateful we really are. I mean, so many Tarantonians came out to events, to exhibitions, to public meetings, to community meetings, and they really contributed to the project. Um, also, community groups, civic leaders, local residents, like public servants and governments. So many people touched this project at some point. And I actually worked with the public engagement team uh, back in 2019. And we were kind of summarizing the work that had happened up to the point where we submitted this proposal to Waterfront Toronto in 2019. And and we engaged more than 21,000 Torontonians in person, hundreds of thousands online. And we got so many 
amazing ideas and, and really important feedback that really refined the proposal, refined our thinking. That will remain important for us, for Sidewalk yeah. Labs as a company. I mean, that 2019 proposal was a plan for Toronto's waterfront, but it was also, you know, a blueprint for urban innovation in a global sense. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm comforted that a lot of the innovations we developed for that plan, a lot of the ones that Torontonians gave us great feedback on too, you know, it will continue to help cities tackle big issues of housing costs, big issues of energy use, things like, you know, robotic furniture, yeah. factory-made mass timber construction that can reduce costs and, and improve sustainability, digital master planning tools, all electric neighborhoods. Maybe we'll even talk about digital electricity next season. Mm. I'm not sure. City of the future. Spoiler, potential spoiler. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, at least we can continue to pursue these big ideas and hopefully help cities in that way. Yeah. And if anyone's interested in diving into those innovations that we've outlined, you can go to sidewalktoronto.ca and you can look at all of the innovations that we proposed back in 2019 and, and hopefully they'll live on in some form. All right. Our next story comes from 1843 Magazine from The Economist. And in this article, Catherine Nixie is writing and asking, as the pandemic leaves offices around the world empty, what was the point of them anyway? So, Eric, what do you think? Are offices <laughs> dead and are we just virtual for forever and always now? You know how much I'm a fan of the virtual podcast. Well, yeah, your hair is is a testament to that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I, this was a, really a fun article. It kind of took a different look at offices at this moment. We've heard a lot about how to kind of redesign offices yeah. for a pandemic future. And maybe we'll talk a bit about that. But this kind of really got into the history of you know, what was a physical office? What was it for? Right. And, and you didn't really have Catherine Nixie's writing the first physical offices until after the Industrial Revolution. Right. She really has some great details and some great quotes. For example, she has one from 1822 by a gentleman named Charles Lamb, who, <laughs> after having spent some time in, in one of these first offices, just writes in a letter to a friend, you know, you don't know how wearisome it is to breathe the air of four pent walls without relief day after day, all the golden hours of the day between 10 and four. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I can, I can relate, you know, when you first start working in an office and it, it is a struggle. <laughs> it, it did have the kind of dramatic feel that you gave to it there, um, with, with that quote. I know we we're kind of all feeling that right now in isolation. <laughs> But after that, you know, you had kind of in the 20th century, the office, the physical office evolved to become much more about efficiency, right? right. This mirrored kind of the factory and the production spaces that, right. that you started to see. And that led up eventually kind of to the open office that we all love and hate today. Right. And you had kind of beyond that, some places trying to inject amenities, you know, into the office so that people will take their breaks there ultimately just kind of keeps you in the office longer. Right. You've got the ping pong rooms right. and the video games and whatever. And then the coffee bars. In the tech world. we just to, to in, the, in the tech world. As a, uh, I've, I've heard. Right. We, we, uh, don't, we don't have, have them. them. <laughs> just, just to reiterate. <laughs> you know, and now you've got the pandemic and you've got empty offices, right. right? So you have, you know, more and more people questioning the value of the physical office or, or maybe maybe kind of just wondering how we can reimagine the physical office. And she kind of makes the important point that it really is a, you know, one size fits all often with these offices, which doesn't really work out. She brings up the point of uh, gender inequity in physical office designs. And I mean, especially when it comes to child care, for example, she notes that the physical offices was created at a time when women were the ones who raised the kids at home. And after that gender dynamic changed, the office did not adapt right. at all. Um, and, not, and not to say that this is only nowadays, this only affects women. This also affects men who are raising children as well. But, you know, now we're seeing this in sharp <laughs> in sharp contrast as everyone's working from home and, you know, you have kids sitting on your lap right. as you're taking your Zoom calls or whatever. So clearly there's kind of design issues at play with the current status of office and really not meeting the needs of a lot of people. But she does note that it is a rather big positive aspect of working in offices, and that is the value of the personal interactions that offices can spur, mm -hmm. right? Which we're obviously missing right now as we're working from home. She quotes Lucy Kellaway, who writes, you know, offices can be as moving as anywhere on earth because what moves us is not sitting at our computer. It's the relationship that we have with people, which I thought was really a nice quote. Yeah. I did too. And there was another one from Thomas Heatherwick, the architect, who talked about physical offices having the chemistry of the unexpected, mm. um, which is a nice turn of phrase there. And the truth is, in that way, 
physical offices are very much like miniature cities, right? That the chemistry of the unexpected is the same type of vibrant street life you get on sidewalks of cities, right. or, or you did at least before the pandemic here. Right. And, and you know, as we start to think of how you redesign streets post-pandemic and, and also offices post-pandemic, we have to find a way for those interactions you know, that kind of support the, the new ideas, the exchange of ideas, the vibrancy of cities, um, and the vibrancy of offices to survive. And I think, you know, one aspect of that is resiliency. It's something we've thought about with a loft office space that we're designing basically is designed to be much more flexible. We know that work is changing. We know from this piece how it's changed over the years. We know it's going to change again. Um, making an office space that is more flexible to the times is part of keeping that relevant. Okay, our final top story of the week comes from Wired and Alex Davies who is doing a profile of Brian Seleski. He is the CEO of Argo. It is a little-known self-driving vehicle company that is trying to crack the big problem of safe, autonomous driving. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, Vanessa, you read this article. It was a very good piece. How is Argo doing? Pretty well, but time will tell. But just to step back a little bit first, and and it kind of explained to folks who may be less familiar, you know, a little bit more about the self-driving landscape right now, right? There are a lot of companies trying to develop autonomous vehicles. That includes kind of more, one of the more well-known ones, which is our sibling company, Waymo. And Argo is less known, but doing some really interesting stuff. And they're working directly with Ford. So in 2017, they actually got a billion dollars to develop tech for Ford's fleet. And they've also started working with Volkswagen as well. So the article really goes deep into the history of autonomous vehicle technology and how Seleski has kind of forged a different path in this industry. Yeah. And I thought it did a great job with this history. I mean, a lot of this is, is known to some folks who who have read these articles before, but he did a really great job, you know, outlining how Seleski studied engineering at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. That was really the kind of early mecca for self-driving vehicle right. technology. Uh, was part of the team that won the famous DARPA Urban Challenge in 2007, which required a car to navigate this kind of fake little mini city. So really a lovely history there. Mm-hmm. And the piece does kind of flesh out how some of the other efforts ap- apart from Argo started to get started, such as, you know, like Waymo's efforts and, and Uber's efforts. And then he gets to Argo, right? And it's It's funny because I actually have a friend who went to Pittsburgh to work for Argo a year or two ago, Hmm. and I had never heard of this company, which I found really weird because I follow this space. But now I I understand (laughs) why from this piece, which is that, you know, the CEO, Seleski, he's not into that kind of showmanship marketing, if you will. He likes to keep the the tech and the company a little bit under the radar. He says in the piece, I don't seek out press. I don't seek out headlines. I don't need that validation. This is why you've never heard of me. It's like, right. that's like correct. That is, I guess that's why. Yeah, that um, right, yeah. But nevertheless, they have been quietly progressing and kind of developing their technology. Like we said earlier, working with these car companies in, in a way that kind of differentiates them from these other companies. And interestingly, a new new move of theirs will be to go to Miami. And Ford and Argo are hoping to launch a robotic taxi and delivery service there in the next few years, and and even to deploy cars there as early as 2022. I mean, that was delayed because of COVID, but I mean, that's still pretty great progress considering how complicated this technology is to develop. For sure. And I think that, you know, the link to COVID there, it's worth mentioning in the sense that this pandemic has really kind of, at least in the U.S., brought the issue of of car fatalities into kind of really stark relief here. You know, we have 30 to 40,000 deaths a year in the U.S. from vehicle crashes. And for some reason, we deem that, or maybe not we all, but many, many folks deem that an acceptable cost of, of kind of the way of life that we've chosen and that has developed in many ways over the years, whether or not we've chosen it. And that, you know, there were politicians saying even early in this pandemic in the U.S., well, we lose 40,000 people a year to cars, but we don't stop using cars. And and I think we really do need to stop mm. and, and question that. And, and folks like Seleski and, and efforts like Argo are trying to stop and question that and say, is that an acceptable cost? Is that an acceptable future? And, and no, it's really not. Yeah. You know, and, and as we think about this specifically in the context of cities, I think if it becomes more convenient or, or less expensive to ride in an autonomous vehicle as this technology gets better and better, that's where you need to start thinking about designing policies that can make sure autonomous vehicles operate in the city's best interest, right? Because 
in that future, you might get many more vehicles on the streets if it's convenient and cheaper, which we know city streets already, they can't handle more vehicles. Yeah. So that might only worsen challenges that we face in terms of vehicle pollution, in terms of traffic congestion. And that's where you have to start thinking about, you know, charging a price to discourage these negative social impacts, a price for all vehicles, really, that we should be thinking about, not just autonomous vehicles, but that encourage folks to use transit or to ride a bike, to use an electric vehicle of some form, and to share rides as well. Definitely. Yeah, I think one of the things that's tricky about self-driving vehicles is that if all we do is introduce them to the roads and change nothing else, then it'll actually be net negative for cities, right? You have mm -hmm. to really take this new technology as an opportunity to redesign our streets and, and our policies so that we are going to have a net positive result, which is ultimately <laughs> less cars on the road and, and more yeah. space dedicated to people, right? And, and we've thought yeah. a lot about that with our street design principles because those principles really take into account Count a future in which AVs are much more common, at least kind of AVs as robo taxis, you know. And so, if you can design streets that are designed either for that kind of traffic, for vehicle traffic or autonomous vehicle traffic, and then set aside other streets that are really more oriented towards pedestrians or cyclists, then you can have a much more balanced kind of streetscape and, and make sure that the city really remains prioritized for people rather than vehicles. Right. Right. And because you can coordinate the speeds and coordinate the routes of AVs as a city, you might be able to achieve that future more easily. So, right. Yeah. That is it for the top stories. As always, you can find the links to these stories in the podcast episode notes. In our next segment, we are going to talk with our colleague, Willa Ng, about a controversial road diet that's happened in Virginia. Back in a sec. We are now joined by Willa Ng. She's the Director of Mobility for Streets here at Sidewalk Labs. And before that, she was a transportation official for New York City and the city of Berkeley. She's going to join us today to talk about road diets. Willa, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good to see you, friends. Willa, thank you for joining us. We got a letter that we wanted your take on. I guess it wasn't a physical letter. We got an email <laughs> from a listener named Jason. Jason lives in Alexandria, Virginia. We think this is right up your alley. Here's what Jason says in this email. Hello. There is a huge bike lane battle that has been going on for over a year near the nation's capital. I'm a local resident, civil engineer in the transportation field, so I follow this topic closely. Google seminary road diet. I would love to see you guys do a deep dive on how we got to where we are and should we have gotten to where we are? Are people's responses justified? So before we get to seminary road itself in Alexandria, I just wanted you, Willa, to maybe step back and unpack for listeners who may not be familiar with road diets, what that concept is, what its history is, and what it tries to achieve. Sure. Road diets, I'm actually a, a fan of road diets. There is an official definition. The FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration, says that road diets are basically when you take a four-lane road, two lanes in each direction, and you reduce it down to a three-lane road, one lane in each direction with a middle lane that's used for left turns. So that's the sort of official dry definition of it, but it's come to mean, I think, in the civil engineering and traffic vernacular as any road where you have too much road, too many lanes for the actual number of vehicles that are using it. Hmm. And that provides an opportunity to reduce the roadway width, reduce the number of lanes, maybe even the lane width to take advantage of safety benefits that may occur. Things like slowing down traffic to a safer speed and also reducing the number of conflicts. The side benefit of that is that you sometimes are able to then eke out or gain new space for things like bicycle lanes, such as they talked about in Alexandria, or even things like sidewalk space. Are road diets a new thing or have cities been doing them for a while? I kind of see road diets as a back to the future kind of thing. Hmm. We've always had narrower streets, especially in our older cities. And in the 50s and 60s, our reaction to growing vehicle use was to add lanes. And I think kind of went overboard. Mm. We went a little too far on it and started to realize in the 60s and 70s, actually, that we didn't actually need all that space. And it actually was doing us a bad turn safety wise. I think it's really picked up steam in the last maybe 10, 20 years, but it's not a new concept. No. 
Okay, so let's fast forward to 2019, 2020. So after Jason wrote us, I did do a little bit of digging. So a dozen civic associations said, we want to keep the street as it is with four lanes. And they were worried that if you reduce the lanes, it would just bring congestion into the neighborhood. Other neighbors, especially biking and pedestrian groups, they felt the opposite. They definitely wanted to reduce the road lanes. They felt it wasn't a very safe street. The city council approved the road diet in September. It went into effect in November 2019, but people were still really upset. And there was this Facebook group that started. It had over 600 people saying like, you know, this is really making rush hour a lot longer. But in early 2020, Greater Greater Washington did report that car travel times had increased by about a minute or so at peak travel times. So, Willow, Mm -hmm. getting to this listener's question, were people's reactions to this road diet justified? I don't pretend to know everything that's going on in Seminary Road in Alexandria, but my reaction is that I'm glad they did that study because there's perception of what's going on and then there's the reality of what's going on. And the reality of what's going on I feel, maybe it's just the engineer in me, should be based on data. And the concerns that people raise, things like cut through traffic, things like backups and speeds, all of that can be documented. And they can do the data collection right now to figure out whether or not the things that people care about are actually manifesting themselves. I think that it would behoove the city of Alexandria to get out there and ask some more probing questions about what people are really concerned about and start to structure their data collection program around that. I suspect just from pattern recognition that there are maybe some other things at play here. Maybe people don't exactly like having cyclists on the road, right? but maybe it really is that people don't like having horn honking. You can structure a data collection program around something like that. Do you think that road diets might actually become a little less controversial now in the in the wake of the pandemic? I think certainly in urban centers that road diets and even certainly we've seen complete road closures have become less controversial because people are just looking for ways to get out and to walk around with a safe distance between them. I think people are starting to look at bicycles as an alternative to short transit trips because they're afraid of getting on transit. And so I think in urban areas that that is true, that that is a factor that will move people towards being more accepting Mm -hmm. of road diets. When we get to the suburban areas, I don't know. Willa, last one, and we'll let you go here. Any final words for Jason as he tries to navigate this local debate? I mean, you you obviously have stood in front of community meetings before as a, as a transportation person. What can he do to push the conversation forward in a healthy way? Well, I would say to Jason, number one, Jason, fight the good fight. <laughs> <laughs> number two, uh, data is your friend. And number three, reach out to what you would consider the opposition and really find out what matters to them. You might be surprised at what you hear. That's brilliant advice. That's great. That's great, Willa. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, Willa. I really appreciate it. Of course. It is now time for our final segment, our favorite segment, Last Smile. In this segment, we set aside the depressing news of the week. This was a rough week, so we need this (laughs) smile. And we focus on something happy for a minute each. Eric, what made you smile? All right. So I really enjoyed this piece in Chicago Magazine saying happy 40th birthday to the word yuppie. Uh Now, this is from Phoebe McGarry, writing in Chicago Mag, pointing back actually into the archives from a 1980 article by Dan Rottenberg in the same mag, talking about yuppies flooding the city of Chicago. Now, I actually didn't realize that the word yuppie was short for young urban professional. Did you know that, Vanessa? If I knew, I'd forgotten, for sure. (laughs) (laughs) I know, I'd forgotten or I blocked it out for some reason. But this was actually a really fascinating piece for a lot of different reasons. It's documenting this trend of largely white professionals moving back into urban cores after decades of, of having been in the suburbs. And this is a good decade before we really started to see population growth in urban cores with all its positive and negative impacts. So I I liked this kind of look back at urban history from Chicago Mag. Ah, And I would be remiss if I did not mention that today is also the birthday of my sister. 
So happy birthday, Rebecca, if you are listening. <laughs> Is Rebecca yuppie? <laughs> she's definitely not. And she's definitely younger <laughs> than uh, than 40. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, happy birthday, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, Vanessa, other than Rebecca's birthday, <laughs> what made you smile this week? So I came across this really beautiful video this week from the team at Juilliard creating this beautiful mix of dance and music to Bolero. They called it Quarantine Bolero. There's a really great write up about it in the Daily Beast from Tim Tiemann, who goes into so much detail about this 10 minute <laughs> video. It's really extraordinary. So like, watch the video first, enjoy it, appreciate the amazing things that the human body can do in terms of creating music and dance. It's really extraordinary. Then read the article because Tim Tiemann gives you some really lovely little uh, background. And he even has a great quote where the choreographer and the director, Larry Keegan, is like describing him shouting <laughs> to people on his Zoom screen, you know, like, follow my lead. Go faster. Grab something. Stop. Melt. People would be moving furniture, breaking things. An animal would enter the shot, leading Kegwin to explain, no, keep the cat. I love the cat. Um, and there's also <laughs> a lot of celebrities in the video, too, that kind of pop up. So well worth a little 10 minute break. You got to keep the cat, right? <laughs> what are you, are you trying to get clicks or not? Well, time is up, folks. Thank you for joining us this week. If you want to read the stories we discussed today and many more, you should sign up for the Sidewalk Weekly newsletter at SidewalkLabs.com. We should note that the views expressed in the Sidewalk Weekly don't necessarily reflect Sidewalk's company position. And if you think that we're missing a perspective, then let us know, like Jason did. Thanks, Jason. Send us an email or a voice memo to podcast at sidewalklabs.com, and we might just talk about it in a future episode. The Sidewalk Weekly is produced by Vanessa and me. Today's episode was edited by Zach McNeese. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions, and our art is by the great Tim Cow. See you next time. Bye.